Hi folks, uh, this is uh, Richard Hall here from uh, Stonehenge Aotearoa and uh, we're looking at our night sky. Now better put our little thingy on there. Right, putting the computer on. Yeah, I know. I can't do it. I know. It's not working. Keep talking. Please. Okay, I've got to keep talking. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay. it's been quite a, a bit of a confusing time with all the... Um, the covert things going on and so on and uh, uh, I sort of work in what, what should we talk about today well I thought the, but the most important thing of course is looking at the big bright stars that we can see in the sky at the moment and uh, if you go out after sunset you can't miss it there's this big brilliant star up there uh, and that of course is the what they call the evening star it's actually the planet Venus Right, and I know we talked about Venus recently, but it's such a, um, a dominant thing in our sky. I thought we'd go over it again today. How are we doing over there? With no, our... We need to restart the computer, so you have to keep talking. So I got okay, yeah. okay, okay. So, so we thought I thought I'd talk about Venus today, and it's it's a rather interesting world. If you look at our solar system and a sequence of planets and so on, uh, what you find is that you've got. Um, different types of planets in different regions so for example close to the sun there's what we call the terrestrial planets these are mercury venus earth and mars and they're called terrestrial because essentially uh well they very much like the earth they're made of rock and iron and they've got thin atmospheres and so on and these are the these are the worlds we're really interested in because they're the worlds where life beyond the earth could actually exist then beyond the um of terrestrial planets we've got what we call the giant planets or often called gas giant planets and these worlds have have got we're on yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah and and uh, these these worlds have got compositions actually similar to the sun except that the important thing about them is that um is that they have their own planetary system so if you look at jupiter Ma, uh, and, and saturn both of them have um something in the region of more than 60 moons there as well you know and um, when you look at some of the larger moons and so on well they are just like the pl terrestrial planets so what we've got is terrestrial planets orbiting around these other uh, anyway um but now for those of you who join us on tv now you can see a, a picture of venus there uh, and venus shows phases just like the moon in fact both mercury and venus do because they're closer to the um <clears throat> to the sun than the earth is so when they're actually in between us and the sun of course we're seeing the dark side of the planet uh, we can only ever see uh, mercury and or venus what we might call full and when it's fully illuminated is when it's on the other side of the sun of course it's at its smallest as well anyway so at the moment if you actually got a pair of binoculars you may just be able to glimpse that venus is actually uh, looks like a sort of half little tiny half moon at the moment okay Okay, so it's the important thing is that, um, our understanding of what these worlds were all about. So Venus, Mars and so on have been worlds which have fascinated people and down through time, uh, what was out there and so on. Well, with the sun, it was always believed that our sun, because it's gradually ageing and long before the time of nuclear energy and so on, people believed that the only way they could understand how the sun was working was simply by gravitational contraction. The idea being that um, the sun is this huge mass, it's hot because it's gravitationally contracting, which when a gravitational object does release energy. And it was just assumed over millions and millions of years, the sun is slowly contracting, right? and releasing energy which bathes us now under this theory of course with the passage of time what happens is the sun's gradually going to go fainter so this theory told us that the you know the planets including the earth were receiving more radiation in the past than they did now and this made people relook at what how the planets would observe so for example uh, it would be assumed that uh, the first planet to have lo uh, life would be Mars because it's further away and it's the first one as the sun cooled down, conditions became possible to support life. And then that's moved to Earth 
and and so on and that's what we believed all right so a good as i said a good example was mars and you look at if you look at mars and um, incidentally just a, a few weeks ago it, it too was in our evening sky but now it's difficult to see it's on the other side of the sun um too or rather too close to the sun to observe but when you look at mars through a telescope you see light and dark markings and you can see white areas which are polar caps all right but the interesting thing about it was that it changed over time so if you go through the seasons what would happen is it got to the summer part of mars the polar caps would shrink and the dark areas would change and their shape and size they would increase and looking at this, there's nothing else you could think about other than that this must be vegetation. The dark areas we're looking at Mars must be vegetation. As, and the theory was that as water was released from the polar regions uh, the, into the dry atmosphere of Mars, so suddenly the life began to spring up and so on. So it's believed that Mars was a world out there where there was life. And of course, not only that, uh, the fact that it would have evolved to support life long before the Earth, life on Mars should have been more advanced than the Earth, right? And um, so the idea, this is where stories like the War of the Worlds came from. And, um, well, I guess there's more stories being written about Mars than any other place, you know, the Martians and so on. And if you read the uh, uh, wonderful books by H.G. Wells and so on, you'll see that science that I'm talking about now, about how what was being observed on Mars and so on and so forth. Uh, when we turned uh, to away from uh, Mars towards Venus, of course, uh, things are a little bit different. If we th consider essentially that Mars is older than the Earth, well, Venus, biological in biological terms, should actually be younger, all right? So this is the thing. So what was beneath, what was there on Venus? And unfortunately, Venus, while it's the most brilliant star-like object in the sky, it's one of the most uninteresting of objects to look at through a telescope. And the reason for this, although it shows phases, its entire surface has never been seen through a telescope because the entire planet is shrouded in thick cloud. Now, it was believed, of course, in the past that these clouds were water vapour, very similar to the um, clouds that we see here on Earth. But what lay behind there? Well, it was believed that if, if, if Mars was older, biology, Venus was younger, well... Maybe what we could see on Venus if we could peer through the clouds is that we'd be looking back into a, um, a primeval world with uh, dense vegetation and swamps and so on, like the Earth was millions and millions of years ago. Just how different Venus was from the Earth we didn't know, but there was even the possibility that creatures like dinosaurs and so on may exist out there. Right? So Venus had this... Um, fascination that out there was this primordial world which one day we could explore well unfortunately all of these theories came to an end when uh, with uh, the nuclear age and for those of you watching this on tv you can see a photograph of an atomic bomb exploding all right the nuclear age and actually the nuclear age was in, it was important because what it did was make us understand the basic energies of the universe which is nuclear forces and as indeed uh, when we look at our own sun our sun is in fact a nuclear reactor uh, releasing vast amounts of energy exactly the same way as a, a hydrogen bomb does right but on a much much grander scale and the reason for this is that the the temperatures and pressures are so high at the centre of the sun that although it's in a gaseous form, in a sense, um, the density is greater than that of any solid known on Earth. And the temperatures, of course, are measured in millions upon millions of degrees. Right? And at these temperatures, uh, atomic nuclei clash and, and absorb each other. And what we've got is the centre of the sun is like a gigantic thermonuclear bomb or thermonuclear reactor. In actual fact, the sun converts fire 600 million tonnes of hydrogen 
into 596 million tonnes of helium every second. So this is a hydrogen bomb, but on a scale absolutely enormous to imagine, far beyond any hydrogen bomb that you can imagine here on Earth. Now, I said 600 million tonnes of helium into into 596 million tons, uh, sorry, hydrogen into helium, into 596 million uh, tons of helium. So the centre of the sun is gradually turning from hydrogen to helium. But you'll notice that there's a 4 million tonne gap uh, mass loss there, because and the reason for that is that in that nuclear process, a certain amount of the matter is annihilated and turned into energy. And this is what happens in a, a nuclear explosion. And the sun is doing this at the rate of 4 million tonnes a second. Right? It's converting matter into energy. And that's the energy that illuminates our sun and then pours out into space. So you should think about that. The sun, every second of its life, is getting 4 million tonnes lighter. In fact, it's slightly more than that because the the, due to the uh, forces at the surface of the sun, another million tons a second is driven off into space just by the pressure. So our sun is is becoming four, five million tons lighter every second. But you know it's been doing that not for millions but for billions of years. And so vast is the mass of the sun uh, that it can continue to do that for billions of years into the future. And for those of you looking at uh, the image of the sun that you can see there. Um, you've got to remember, at this scale, our sun would be just a dot, so you could fit over a million Earths inside the globe of the sun. So the sun is a great nuclear reactor. Right? However, this changes our perception, our theories on how planets evolved. All right? Because, interestingly enough, what actually happens is that with the passage of time, planets don't get less energy, or rather more, less energy, they actually get more. So in other words, as the sun evolves through time, it's actually becoming brighter. And this means that in the past, right, the sun was giving off less energy than it is today. Right? And this applied to all the planets. Right? So it means that our old theories of, of Venus being younger than the Earth in biological terms and Mars being older just didn't work. And indeed, um, it, the theory was that there must be something really strange about Venus because its conditions should be similar to the Earth and it's gradually been changing, the sun's gradually been brightening. But um, what's happened to Venus? Well, well, we sent spacecraft to Venus and when we ploughed through the clouds, the Russians were the first to do this, and they ploughed through the, through the atmosphere and then after a while the spacecraft simply stopped so they sent another one and this same, this same thing to happen so they started getting a bit worried about this they realized that something was destroying or stopping the spacecraft from working right, so then eventually they sent an armored plated one and this managed to reach the surface and then they discovered what had happened to their spacecraft before because when we went down to beneath the surface of Venus, what we discovered was that the surface was the nearest thing to hell that you could imagine. Yes, it was a world like the Earth, but like a volcanic world. The temperature of the surface of Venus is so hot that mortary metal would uh, melt like leads and so on, would melt. Furthermore, the atmospheric pressure is so high, over 100 atmospheres, it was greater than what you would find at the bottom of an ocean. So this is what happened to these, these uh, spacecraft. It was crushed and burnt. Furthermore, the atmosphere was mostly carbon dioxide. But the clouds that you could see contained sulfuric acid. So literally, your spacecraft there will be dissolved so, as I said, Venus is the nearest thing to hell that you can imagine. How on earth did we get such a world so different uh, to our own planet? But the interesting thing is, from the analysis of atmosphere and so on, what we discovered is that it hasn't always been like that. That once upon a time, Venus, just like the Earth, was a warm planet, just a warm planet. 
with water, liquid water, and possibly even life. So once upon a time, millions of years ago, perhaps Venus was like the Earth, and perhaps there were living things on it, but it's turned into a, an absolute hell, all right? So that's what it would have, might have been like. At the same time, we know, because this is because the sun is slowly being brightening, when, when Venus was a, a beautiful world of, um, with uh, possibly uh, oceans and possibly life, we know, or now know, and this is from geological evidence, that this, the Earth was an ice ball. People often wonder why advanced forms of life on Earth took such a long time to evolve. Uh, you know, because the Earth's four and a half billion years old and advanced forms of life have only uh, appeared in the last few hundred million years. The reason is, though it had oceans, what happened was that the entire surface of the Earth was frozen down. That causes the oceans as well. And so only microscopic life could exist beneath those, those uh, and evolve beneath those ice sheets. It's only over time, as the sun began to brighten, the ice on the ocean's worlds began to... Uh, melt away and that's when we see the explosion of life into multi-celled creatures so while, while um, the earth was a nice ball well Venus could have been a planet like the earth is today all right? and this all brings us down to what we call global warming I'm sure a lot of you have heard the term global warming all right? well the, the Earth has been suffering global warming for a long period of time and will continue to do so. And just we, just the same as we think Venus was a water world, which is now turned into an inferno, with the passage of time, due to the slow brightening of the sun, this is going to happen to the Earth as well. All right? So in other words, the Earth is also going to be turned into a hell. But don't worry, uh, when we talk about global warming, and I know some people have been talking about global warming here on Earth, uh, people have suggested that the sun's a cause of it. No, it's not, because you see, the change in luminosity of the sun is so slow that it's not going to turn into a hell for another one and a half billion years. So you've still got one and a half billion years of where the sun's uh, it's going to be a, quite a pleasant planet to live on before it begins to turn into a hell and the reason why it turns into it does eventually turn into hell is that as the water evaporates away it releases carbon dioxide and that's a greenhouse gas and so you get this domino effect where it gets hotter and hotter and hotter now talking about global warming of course is in something we've been talking about because we have got evidence of global warming right now but of course it's not the sun it's human beings are causing this just by the co doing exactly what the sun does over millions upon millions of years but actually doing it just over a small uh, number of decades or centuries right is the release of co2 and other gases into the atmosphere which are trapping the sun's energy and gradually causing a rise in temperature and of course this can create a domino effect and that's what we're worried about you reach a level where suddenly the at the climate can immediately change and i look i can remember long long before anybody's ever talked about global warming when i was at victoria university looking at the um core samples that would be brought back from there and the interesting thing was as you looked at them you what you discovered was that um, there was this gradual rise in CO2 content in the Earth's atmosphere. And then when you plotted it on a graph and then plotted the rise in human population since the Industrial Revolution, the two were going hand in hand. There's absolutely no doubt that the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere is due to human beings, and that in turn means an increase uh, in, in global temperatures. And with increasing temperatures... The, the uh, atmosphere has got more energy, so that means you're going to get more star, storms and so on. And you're going to get a shifting atmosphere and climate. So where you used to have, get a lot of water, you suddenly don't get any or very little. Or another place you might 
where it normally dry you would get water so the climate changes and in the past we used to put up with climate changes because we could move around these days human peons can't so folks do not think this is nonsense scientists everywhere saying this is real and we do not want to create a domino effect whereby we're going to turn our planet earth into something like the surface of venus all right so that's what we're going to do well apart from um uh, venus in the sky once it, the sun goes down you're going to lose sight of venus but there's not a big bright star in the sky and that's the planet jupiter and even with a pair of binoculars uh, you can see some of those whirls that i was talking about a little bit earlier on of uh, uh, the four big bright uh, moons of Jupiter, of course, moons are actually planets Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. They are to like terrestrial planets. Each was absolutely unique, but I won't go into too much detail on those because uh, each has got their own story and we can have a look at those at another time. But with a pair of binoculars, you can often see up to four of those moons uh, in around Jupiter. Of course, um, even in a big telescope, we can't see what Io and Europa looks like. You have to send spacecraft out there. So it wasn't until the space age that we began to realise that each of the big planets has also got their own planetary system. OK, now, having said that, you know, that every, uh, you know, has got a, we've got this planetary system around every big object and it's a natural process, the same as the, the planets are simply the debris of the disk left behind from the formation of our sun. And when you look out at the night sky at night, and for those of you watching this on TV, you can see this magnificent image of the Milky Way <coughs> above the Stonehenge. And when you look at that, every dot there is a distant sun, a star is a sun, right? And even when you look at the thousands and thousands of stars in that image, you've got to realise that that's only a small percentage. In our own galaxy, there's uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of stars. And our galaxy is only one of millions of galaxies. The number of stars in the universe, well, there's more stars out there in the universe. And remember, when I say a star, I mean a sun. There are more suns in the universe than there are grains of sand on all the world, beaches of the world. And each of those are going to have a planetary system. So, boy, if you think we're, somehow this is, we're unique. Well, we may be unique in the actual life forms we've got here, but there's going to be biological after biological world out there. And right now, of course, uh, scientists are spending their time trying to sort out we've a little while ago of course our technology wasn't good enough to detect worlds around other stars now it is <clears throat> we now know of thousands of planets around other stars the number is growing and what of course we're looking for now is other earth-like planets yet other things is don't <clears throat> lose heart some magnificent things our spacecraft are discovering things particularly on mars i just wanted to show you this wonderful photograph taken by the curiosity uh photographing the surface of mars and here it comes now for those of you watching on it uh can you see the woman on mars there she is there shows you how the human brain can construct things all right so there's the woman on mars Anyway, folks, just to talk a bit funny to finish off by talking about some of the wonderful things we've got coming up at Stonehenge. We've reopened, as I said, uh, from uh, Wednesday, uh, last Wednesday. Uh, we're only doing things which fall inside the, uh, inside the uh, restrictions of the COVID and making sure people are safe when they come out to Stonehenge. All right? And we have got some special things happening, which are going to be organised a little bit differently because of the covert and so on first of all coming up actually on this coming thursday at six o'clock we've got the spring equinox that is the day of the spring equinox and we're going to be doing a spit oh well i'm going to be doing a special presentation on the tales of the spring equinox why it was so important and how it's played a major role in in religions and other places from around the world so we're going to be looking at that and we're starting early at six o'clock the idea is that we if it's all nice and clear we can take you out and you'll be able to see the equinox sunset where the sun will set on the equinox stone which it only does of course on two days of the year of the two equinoxes so that's at stonehenge this coming thursday uh, september the 23rd at six o'clock is the equinox 
some other important things coming up. We're going to do a special presentation. We've got um, Our Place in Space and Time. Now, I've been sort of gabbling on a little bit about that in this pr in presentation now. But we're going to take you through space and through time to show you how life on Earth has evolved here and out there in the universe and our place within it. Right? So we're going to be taking you through space. And, and that's going to become a bit of a shock because it will put things into perspective about human civilization and so on. So our place in space and time, and that's going to be on October the Wednesday, October the 6th at Stonehenge at Artira. Coming up also, we've got um, in, on the 9th of October, on Saturday the 9th, we've got a special presentation. The Phoenix Astronomical Society has their meeting there, and Keith Austin is going to be giving a talk in space. Nobody can hear a planet scream. Now, it might seem strange, but for those of you who know, uh, as well as astronomy, uh, Keith's actually uh, also a, a well-known musician. And he's going to be talking about radio waves and the different radio waves and radio broadcasts we get from neutron stars and planets and so on. So we're going to be hopefully be listening to uh, the sounds of worlds beyond the solar system. So that's coming up on Saturday 9th of October at 7 o'clock. At, again at Stonehenge at because that's where the society's club rooms are and also at the same meeting I'm going to be giving a short presentation called Stellar Champions and um, I'm going to be looking at the weird and wonderful stars in, that, in our own galaxy and so on okay folks so that's it uh, Stonehenge is open from Wednesday to Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And all of those programs I'm talking about, you can just have a look on our webpage and you'll be away. Bye bye, and I'll catch up with you soon. <laughs>